Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe, a little special edition here with the Investment Committee. It's a short week in the markets. You're likely getting this here at the beginning of the week, and we want to we wanna get it out to you before your Thanksgiving uh, weekend starts off. I have no doubt that a lot of you would prefer to spend your holiday weekend coming up uh, listening to us talk central banking and and macroeconomics and, and more uh, kind of commentary on the stock market. But because some of you may not want that and because we don't want to do it, uh, we're, we're instead going to kind of get this investment committee podcast done earlier in the week and, and we're um, atta- uh, attacking a real specific issue this week. So I'm surrounded here today by Robert, Julian, Brian, and Dea, and we are going to talk about the highly niche topic of the presidential election once again, and with a little particular emphasis on this new ascendant kind of climber in the polls, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. How many of you could have pronounced his name a month ago, three months ago? Two days ago. Two days ago, (laughs) you were there. Buttigieg, yeah. I was grateful when he first entered the race that he was so low in the polls because I I didn't have to go actually commit myself to learning how to pronounce it, Mm -hmm. but now now it's coming up a lot more. Mm And, and we're not going to only kind of uh, address that. I, I think we've already done the broader podcast that we had done on just the general approach that investors think about politics, let alone politics a year in advance of the election. And I think that that podcast um, covered a lot of the principles that we don't have to restate today, just in terms of investors sometimes letting their political uh, preferences get in the way of, of sound investment policy. It's a, a mistake I've seen plenty of people on the left and plenty of people on the right do. But more particularly, I want to focus just on on using uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg's platform to kind of discuss some of the other topics that are at play and where they may in fact impact either macro or, or company-specific, you know, sector-specific areas. So to really quickly set this up and why we're, we're going to this candidate, first of all, Mayor Pete, um, has no federal uh, uh, political experience, and that's not a disqualifier anymore whatsoever. Of course, our current president had no elected experience at any level of government. I think technically it's an it's an asset, right? I mean, it, it, it is for some. I yeah. mean, it's not for everyone. That that's the interesting thing about populism and about anti elitism is generally there will be someone out there that gets really excited that this person's not part of the Beltway or not part of the what's the things Trump the swamp. Hmm. But there's also plenty of people that say, look, I want folks with experience. I want someone who's been inside the machinations of government. So I don't know how to quantify that. But I think that there are some that's a negative one and some that's a positive one. And you probably end up at about a break even yeah. when all's said and done. Um, Mayor Pete's an interesting choice, by the way, for the anti-elitist because – because on one hand, he doesn't have the experience in federal government, and that's going to excite a lot of people, not part of the swamp. And he's the mayor of a, a town in Indiana with 100,000 people, which is more or less the population here in Newport Beach. In Newport's it's around 90,000. Um, and I have been in South Bend, Indiana many times, of course, because I go out for the uh, USC Notre Dame game every other year. Now, how far is South Bend from where you grew up, Robert? Uh, I was outside of Chicago, but I, I actually had some good experience in South Bend going to some uh, Silverhawks uh, minor league baseball games back in the day as well. So, what are the Silverhawks based in South Bend? They are South Bend Silverhawks. So you were you probably should say that because I don't think anyone. <laughs> oh I yeah, mean, the Silverhawks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Of course, everyone knows. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I bet money on that. Yeah. But yeah, no. So so you you know South Bend. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do Hoosiers generally hate South Bend or like South Bend? No, I mean Notre Dame is kind of distinct. They're they're more of a regional, you know, private private school. Uh, Indiana, where I went to school, is uh, has more of a rivalry with, uh, dare I say, Purdue. Uh, oh yeah, so, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, fair enough. Well, I don't know. Um, he uh, what the point I was about to make was that he he has this anti elitist things. He hasn't been in federal government. But he is a Ivy League guy, and I, I want to say scholar. road scholar yeah, and so forth. Yeah. Military and yeah, yeah, yeah. A high level. Like, so he doesn't exactly have this kind of Queens vibe. But again, a mixed bag of elitism and elitism is hardly new because who has ever better described it than the current president, who ran off of this red baseball cap? I'm the guy from Blue Collar America. While he was taking a private helicopter to the rooftop of his Fifth Avenue yeah. apartment yeah. where where he lived. And so you, there's strange sort of mixed cultural, you know, affiliations these days. But I think that um 
Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, there's a kind of more progressive camp in the Democratic Party, and all of which have a chance of becoming president, certainly have a chance of becoming the nominee, and then you have, you're going to have a very close election next year. Do all of us still agree on that, that the 2020 general election is likely to be close? Anyone want to push back on that? I don't have a lot to push back on. It's yeah. tough not knowing who the nominee on the Democratic side right. is going to be, but I would assume either way it would be a close, you know, be close just based on where polling is and, and where Trump's approval rating is. It's, and it's and, who, and who the high. field of candidates is, like, I agree. I, I've said if someone told me that Michelle Obama was in the race, I might feel yeah. different. Um, or if the only Democrat running was, you know, just some uh, whatever, like uh, un totally, clearly unelectable candidate. Sanders. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Um, that with Warren, she she was so out front of everybody else on different policies that we could come in as market people and investment people and look at her impact because she had 53 white papers on student debt, mm -hmm. on health care cost, on on um, green, uh, you know, clean energy, uh, various spending initiatives. So now now it's sort of like, OK, there's, it looks like there might be a new front runner and we have to sort of do it all over again. But it's a lot of the same issues. Mm -hmm. So I guess let's start off, I'm going to give you guys a real softball, and then I'm going to dig into Mayor Pete a little bit on this stuff. Um, is there anything in the macro, in the way we philosophically would want to address 2020 investing um, that is different in your mind than what you might have shared on this podcast? What was it a month or two ago when we last did this? Um, has anything changed that now gives it more clarity or more conviction, more caution in terms of how we view what is still one way or the other a year out uh, for how we go about investing 2020. Daya, you feel any different on the macro? Uh, on the macro level, I, uh, I can't say that I do. I guess with Elizabeth Warren declining in the polls substantially uh, relative to the other Democratic candidates, that makes me feel that Socialist policies are less likely, but uh, uh, so uh, as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, I mean, slightly less likely. But other than that, I uh, the the changing in the political scene has it affected my thinking of uh, you know how we think portfolios are going to perform. Oh uh, yeah, I can't I can't say that I do. I can't come up with anything that uh, that changes my beliefs there. So. Brian, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I would I would echo that. I, I, nothing has changed on the macro. Um, there's not enough known um, outcome to this thing yet. I would say if you look at what's going on in today's market after the debate from last night, I guess if we're looking at sectors and different things, you can kind of see how the market's reacting with the Buttigieg surge in, in a war and decline, which is that you've got energy stocks up today, you've got um, electric car companies up today, th you know, th some of the things on his agenda, but does that change our macro view on how we would invest client money? No, absolutely not. Mm. Now, Julian, you've done a pretty good job uh, in these different podcasts, always bringing back the issue to earnings, our earnings expectation. Even in the last podcast that we did, we talked about where the Fed was going to be going into the year. Has anything changed uh, that from the politics into earnings, Fed, trade? Um I guess politics, you know, people, uh, you know, need something to chew on. They talk, you know, if they breeze the market, to speak about the market every day, they're going to talk about politics somehow, you know, this candidate could have an impact on earnings, but it's still very theoretical and it's a year away. And, and as you say, it's going to be close. So I think it's, uh, I would say for 2020 um, forecast for now, it's uh, irrelevant. And what's much more irrelevant to us is the Fed. And now I guess we're at the point where they, they've posed, you know, uh, so we are probably not going to have too much happening at the Fed level now uh, in 2020, unless, you know, the economy gets much better, much worse. And and then the trade war, I think, is really clearly number one. And um, and that's, I think for me, that's the one macro thing that's clearly on top, I would put a, a, on top, you know, at the, at the top of the list. And then, of course, earnings. And so we just finished the Q3 earnings season, and now I'm going to have to wait for you know, mid-January for the next uh, set of results. Yeah, see, I agree completely. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of people on the right would not like me saying, uh, but it is, I'm, I'm right about it. If right now, we God told us, Trump's getting reelected in a year, and the trade war is going to get worse in 2020, markets would go down. If uh, God told us the trade war is done, it's fixed, permanent, great resolution, and in a year you might have, you're going to have probably Biden or Buttigieg. I'm leaving Warren out just to make it simpler, okay? I think the markets would go higher. Yeah. And, and so I think that the macroeconomic issue 
both in the sequence of events, but in the priority of impact to markets is a bigger deal than the politics. Robert, what say you? I, you know, I think it, the the animal spirits result of, of tax reform hasn't been fully realized as a result mm. of, I think, largely uncertainty around the trade war. So I, I still think there's some, some you know, coiling of that spring that we're waiting for. Um, on a go-forward basis, you know, we, we hope for that, the, the unleashing of those animal spirits to be resulted in, you know, better earnings going forward. But we, we can't control that. So I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say smooth sailing ahead, but we're, we're still just kind of in anticipatory mode at this point in time. I wouldn't say our outlook has changed. I think a lot of the uh, political uh, pr presumed policies could, you know, incrementally adjust where we have preferences here and there. But I don't think there's anything really that we can steer towards right now. So, so I want to be able to use that as a segue right into a particular policy aspect that, that Mayor Pete is right out in front of. And, of course, all the Democrat candidates, I think, have said they would repeal Trump's corporate right. tax reform. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any that said, no, we want to keep that. Yeah. Um, but, but before I do that, let's at least let our listeners understand why we're talking about this guy, Mayor Pete. Because in fairness, you know, he's not by no means the front runner Yet, but look, the the betting polls when we use the aggregate to predict it, um, you had Elizabeth Warren up near fifty percent right around the time I signed a book deal to write a book about her, <laughs> and she's now at twenty five percent, still in the lead. Okay, yeah. But you had Mayor Pete, um, who was sitting somewhere at around five percent just six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, mm. is up to nineteen percent in the betting odds for securing the nomination, yeah. not for being elected president. That's very interesting. Not just Warren's draw. It appears that it's it's uh, inverse correlation between mm -hmm. Warren and Buttigieg. Biden's still kind of around the same place. Sanders around the same place. So there's a narrative out there in the political punditry circle, but I think it's important to our conversation because I think it's mostly a right narrative. It's this battle for the so-called moderate lane mm -hmm. that really has everything to do with electability. Mm -hmm. That, in other words, people are not saying, I like Pete better than Warren, or I don't like Warren, or I like Biden. They're all saying, eh, who's going who's gonna to win? Because their biggest priority is mm -hmm. winning. And the reason I feel a little bit of empathy for, for our, our Democratic brothers and sisters is that I think, uh, myself being a Republican guy, I've gone through it in multiple elections where you're kind of like, oh, I like this candidate, but then you don't think he can win, so you move to another, but your priority is winning the election. The entire Pete Buttigieg subject is not about Mayor Pete. It's about... Their, their desire to have somebody they think can win. And there is clearly, even for people who might like some of Elizabeth Warren's stuff, there's a, clearly a, a view that, uh, that she's going to have a tough time winning. Mm -hmm. And so then comes Mayor Pete. And that's one of the things that's so hard about evaluating his policies is uh, what does he really believe? Well, it's tough to say because he's very wisely said, I got to go find this moderate lane. Mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure that he's as moderate as his marketing message is now. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's certainly what I would do if I were him. Sure. But when you look at so so okay, so all that to say mm. he's he's increased in the betting odds and he's now essentially right at the top in Iowa. He's now running at 21% um in Iowa where Liz Warren who had been at about 24 25 is down to 18 or 19. Uh, so why does Iowa matter for a state? The last four Democratic uh, uh, candidates that won Iowa got the nomination, right? So let's, let's talk uh, correlation, causation, <laughs> and this is fascinating. You bring this up. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Uh, you are correct. Al Gore won Iowa, got the nomination, lost the election. John Kerry won Sorry. Iowa, Clinton. lost the nomination. Obama won Iowa, won the nomination, won the election. Hillary Clinton won Iowa, won the nomination, lost the election. Four in a row, three of which did not win the general election, but did win the primary. However, you know, four in a row is not exactly rock. So if we had an equity characteristic that had four uh, out of six, we mm. wouldn't necessarily call it rock so solid. Mm. And and Harkin, who I forgot was even uh, uh, around, um, beat Clinton in Iowa. And, and, of course, Clinton got the nomination back in 92. And Dick Gephardt won Iowa in 88. And, of course, Michael Dukakis ended up winning the nomination so you had two in a row where it didn't hold up, and then you had four it did. But this is why I really actually think it's worthless. This is the Republican side. Why would Republican and Democrat be that different? Ted Cruz won Iowa. Trump got the nomination. Rick Santorum won Iowa. Mitt Romney got the nomination. Mike Huckabee won Iowa. John McCain got the nomination. So the last time that a Republican won Iowa and won the nomination was Bush all the way back in 2000s, 20 years ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there's there's a uh, correlation of um, less, you know, Obama, uh, Clinton, when he sort of won, you know, got ahead in the polls and kind of won, was going to win Iowa, he kind of surged from there and just sort of straight line up and end up kind of winning the whole deal, uh, winning the presidency. And I think that's sort of the correlation with what's happening with Buttigieg, perhaps. But the difference also is the South. You know, Buttigieg doesn't have the, the support like those other people that you've mentioned did in the South. And that's a game changer as far as his winability, you know. Yeah, so, yeah that's uh, a good point. Yeah, that that the uh, in other words, with the Obama precedent, he was already looking good in some of the later yeah. southern states. Then he got the Iowa momentum, so he could parlay it. Where in some of these other cases, uh, like for example, with Ted Cruz winning Iowa, then he goes to New Hampshire and Trump just trounced everybody. Yeah. Where this could lead to more dominoes that that yeah. fall. So one of the things he's campaigned on is the idea of getting rid of the corporate tax reform. Robert just got done saying that. Um, we don't. We haven't realized all the economic impact of the stimulative effects of the Trump tax bill. Julian talked about the importance of macro over politics. Uh, what do you think? Would he actually repeal Trump's tax bill? I think back to Republicans running over and over and over and over again about getting rid of Obamacare. And then the Republicans get in charge and they can't get rid of Obamacare. Could Trump's tax bill be a little bit more popular with Democrats now that it's passed and in law and the stock market's up thousands of points than some of them, want, the ones who voted against it, would want to admit? Can you really repeal a tax cut like that? I think with some of their agendas costing so much money, whether it's health care or, you know, it, any of it, I, I think it's on the docket to get rid of to try to pay for it. You know, it's, you know, so I think that they... There's, a, there's, they would want to, and Buttigieg talked about that too. That's how he's going to pay for his health care plan. He's going to repeal the tax reform. It's 1.4 trillion dollars, roughly. That's going to pay for it all, and then we'll be in the same mm-hmm. place we are, you know, from a budget perspective, and we get better health care out of it. So I think it's on their agenda. Um, so could, you're saying it as a revenue raising thing, get rid of the corporate tax cut because it raises revenue if you get rid of it. Yes. I can't possibly give Daya a better softball than <laughs> Go this ahead. one. Daya. <laughs> Yeah. Would giving getting rid of the corporate tax bill yeah. put the economy in recession? And when do you raise revenue in a recession? <laughs> you see what I'm saying, Brian? Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. I do. I do. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the uh, you know the, the notion that if you raise taxes, you are going to raise uh, revenues. And as far, or I mean, I mean, just just the idea that you are going to raise taxes and automatically your tax receipts are going to be higher is uh, something's been disproven on many, many occasions. Can't we agree um, that they might go higher, but not dollar for dollar? Right. Definitely I, not dollar okay, for dollar. Right. But, but that, my point yeah. wasn't that. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. That's the way that they that's would That's what the way they would it. Yeah, that's always, no, no, I, I understand. Yeah. I, that's yeah. always the way it's, it's, it's positioned. But obviously, uh, markets anticipate these things, and markets are reflexive. And, and, and just like it goes, goes uh, speaks to his uh, raising the minimum wage, too. I mean... Uh, the law of unintended consequences apply, and um, it, it, the, the free market makes the decisions uh, that are in its own interest and very often have different consequences and result, finally, in a different tax re- – you know, the amount of tax receipts that are received is, uh, is much different than – uh, the, the, these politicians, I assume, care to know. It's all. It's really about the marketing, of the message, and all that. So let's 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 give about. some support to Brian's thesis that they have to do some of these things uh, because of the optics of the spending. Um, with Elizabeth Warren, it's you know, some, it seems to a lot of people cartoonish, but they're real policy proposals, and the and and it's very difficult for people to pay attention when you start using T trillion with a T. because you go like, oh, this fifty trillion, thirty trillion. It's uh, it all just sounds so ridiculous. People tune out. But line item by line item, there are expenditures attached to proposals. Let's just use Mayor Pete. He's talking about $80 billion to expand high-speed broadband. We'll come back to how that could impact mm-hmm. telecom. But, but what stuck out to me is a $200 billion fund to replace, uh, to, for displaced workers, $50 billion in workforce retraining, $430 billion in low-income housing tax credit, $170 billion housing choice, $700 billion child care. Um, you're 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 getting kind of Warren level, and you know. Trillions. You're into T. You're yeah, into yeah, trillion with a T stuff mm-hmm. going on. Um, I wonder if we need to not focus on what uh, Mayor Pete or this whole platform does to the stock market, but what it does to the dollar, what it does mm-hmm. to the bond market. You know, Julian, do we do we face even higher deficits than the Trump administration's allowed? with some of these things going on, and does that affect our macro viewpoint? Um, 
I have less, uh, I don't have a lot of experience on the uh, US politics, but my understanding is like when Democrats are in power, usually they are like even more aggressive at, you know, running deficits. Yeah. So I would say that if you have a Democrat, you know, a presidency, you probably would have even more deficits uh, going forward. Um, and and, and I, I just, I was going through some of uh, what uh, Mayor Pete said. And it's interesting to see, like, if you look, go back to when you were, uh, I guess, he announced his nomination back to April, it's very different from what he says today. So at the time, you know, he was interviewed by CNBC and he was uh, saying that he, we should consider a wealth tax. Mm -hmm. He was talking about a financial transaction tax. He was talking about I mean, taxing um, um, estate as well. So I think he's, he's smart. Like he, needs to, he see a space and he's, he's shifting his, you know, um, his well, policies yeah. based on that. So who knows what his policy is going to be in six months, right? Um, yeah, that's what goes back to that thing I said earlier, the market, the lane. The marketing. The, the, the lane moderate, that someone has to lane. be in. It's yeah. going to be hard to run in a class warfare message and maintain a moderate lane. There's a way, there's a way traditionally people have threaded that needle. Uh, Bill Clinton did it masterfully as a politician. I think that to be a corporatist and a populist at the same time is very tough to do. So you have to sort of find a different message. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to stick with you, Julian, just from an equity research standpoint. This talk about uh, you, we of course own some companies. We're not going to say any names that are um, REITs in the high end mall space that are directly levered to to retailers. We even own a couple of companies that have retail presence. Um, $15 an hour minimum wage, federally administered, which uh, he's running on. And I got to think most of the other Democrats are running on as well. Let's say something like that were to pass. It's passing in more and more states anyways. Does that eat away at margins of some of these restaurants and we have to be careful about that? Or is it accelerating these companies move into technological replacement so that they get ahead of it? In other words, does it have the opposite effect of what the politicians are hoping for? Well, that's a, a good question. It's tough. I would have really have to think out about uh, on a name by name basis, how, you know, would they be, uh, how would they would be impacted? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, how, how many of the workers at some of the fast food chains are on minimum wage? Um, I think quite a lot are already lot yeah. above the $15. So I, I um, I, I I think it may not have such a big impact on most of the companies we own, really. But um, you know, I would have to really dig into um, into the names one by one. Yeah. Do you think that um that right now with e-commerce and all the pressures we talk about, uh, this would be a good time to raise cost at restaurants and retail, and and uh, potentially force more kiosks and more automation. Uh, if the la in other words, could it have an impact on the labor depart in the labor um, market at the lower end of the wage scale, Robert? I'm so it would it would definitely, in my opinion, not erode margins for a lot of these companies. People are going to move into uh, you know automation things like that. With with Mayor Pete, the one of the biggest shockers around him with regards to some of these you know cost increasing policies, he comes from South Bend, Indiana. Okay, Steel Belt, Rust Belt, whatever you want to call it. A region that has been plagued by the the flight of capital, by uh, to an extent anti-competitive policies before some of the more Indiana tax-friendly policies came in, and then he's seen, you know, from my home state of Illinois, a lot of a lot of movement of capital into Indiana because they were competitive. So mm. I I just don't understand when someone's going to run on being a mayor of a, of a small city. You know, they've kind of tracked along with the other uh, major cities in Indiana along uh, unemployment, economic growth perspectives. What? Why isn't he drawing from his experience in what went right, what went wrong in his city, in his region? That that continues to shock me yeah. going forward. So, you know, the, the $15 minimum wage, I mean, someone in South Bend living on $15 an hour is, is doing okay. I mean, cost of living yeah. in some of those places are fine. So maybe he's just thinking about, you know, giving his constituents a raise. I don't I don't know necessarily. Um, a lot of the other policies, he's, he's, he's being vague on yeah. a lot of these still going forward. I think... He's he's kind of preserving the the ability to be a, a, a middle ground guy, but I think from a corporate perspective, a lot of these things are very unfriendly, and he should know better. Well, let's let's even move that then into what is a pretty significant part of his policy portfolio, which is in climate change. And of course, from investment standpoint, we have a lot of skin in this game as oil and gas pipeline investors, as investors in a couple of the larger integrated energy companies, U.S. Uh, believing in the U.S. energy infrastructure story. Um, here, he has not adopted the language of Green New Deal, but he's a, uh, adopted some of the philosophical 
um, objectives of that of that uh, left oriented climate environment. He um, did not say he wants to ban fracking uh, on day one, which is what uh, his competitor, Senator Warren, had said. But he does say he wants to ban it on federal lands, all new development. Um, he's talking about net zero emissions by 2050. And then and then I just want to read a few things so everyone gets an idea of why I'm asking the questions to, to my partners here I'm about to ask. A $250 billion with a B dollar fund for a global investment initiative to build U.S. clean energy uh, in China and other places. That sounds really generous. The issuance of climate action bonds. I, could, I can't tell you what those are. They sound like someone will make some good money off of those. Uh, an American clean energy yeah. bank. That yeah. sounds lovely with a capitalization of $250 yeah. billion. Another $100 billion in urban surface transportation over 10 years. Um, all these are separate policies. They're not overlapped here. These are mm -hmm. line items. So again, you're you're up at that trillion dollar level. Mm -hmm. Does this um, make clean energy look investable to you or less investable? And for our purposes, because I define clean energy as natural gas, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to accept his definition and pretend it's wind and solar only. Does that does all of this subsidies and federal government money make clean energy more investable or less investable, Dan? So we're, are we going to assume that a lot of these, let's say he does get elected yeah. and, and he gets a lot of these through. things pa pass? Yeah. Well, for the sake of argument, we'll assume that. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, okay. So for the sake of argument, we'll assume that. Um, I, well, look, if a company is being subsidized to, as far as wind and solar goes, it's going to decrease their costs of production uh, and essentially... Uh, if you're if you're lowering if you're if you're lowering their cost structure, uh, it's going to improve their margins and it's going to improve the valuation of the firm. I I don't know and and again I don't know the nuances. Now you're stating of the, that as a fact or or making an argument. I, I'm making an argument for it. I, as far as uh, and, and I and I can't speak to how competitively the landscape will change, but just as far as if I'm if I am a uh, a, a a a wind guy, let, let's say, and I own a a bunch of wind turbines or yeah. whatever it is, and the government's willing to give me subsidies, it's going to help aren't, my aren't business you just in the go short put, term. Put wind farms up where it's not economically exactly. productive to do it. That's that's the problem there. I mean, you you want to put just let's use turbines as an example. Okay. Market forces dictate you want to put them where they're most efficient, right? Maybe far out to sea where they're not a blight, things like that. You, when when there's no you know outside government influences, you do the economically rational choice geographically, right? When you when you essentially throw money at different industries, you're you're attempting to pick winners. You, you know, in some cases with energy, you're, you're trying to make losers out of it. We've seen how the renewable energy space has had a lot of losers. Look back to the Obama administration. What was it? I, I don't know if we're allowed to say certain companies. No, we're not. But you know, there were there were several to pick from, right? And it, it, it doesn't you, work yeah. without. Yeah. With, luckily, I'm not worried about anyone breaking sure. our compliance rule here because I know the answer to this question. Could you name a company, wind and solar? That right now is a higher stock price than when Obama took office. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I you cannot. Can't. And um, I would say, you know, to answer your question, uh, is it investable? It's hardly investable now. I think with more subsidy, it would be less investable, not more investable. That's my opinion on it. I think there'll be collateral damage or other things that will happen if this stuff kind of comes through. And, and it would technically probably benefit some of the companies that we own in some ways because we own companies that produce oil and gas and, and, and ship that and transport it. And the fact that there'd be more regulation and less ability to produce it, the prices would likely go higher and corporate profits might go up a little bit and those types of things. But uh, I'm, I'm not against clean energy. I, of course I, not. I, I think, yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think we've made huge strides in this country and in the world, frankly. Um, and I think that should continue. But as far as you know, you know, creating a bank with two hundred fifty billion dollars solely for the, the you know the, those types of things, I don't think that they're that efficient, and I don't think it's money well spent personally. I well, think free and, market and I capitalism. Think, I think uh, to something Robert was saying, and and to kind of piggyback into Dea's point, that one of the arguments here, that one of the policy prescriptions is extending and modernizing existing tax credits. For solar, wind, geothermal, and then and then this is the the compliment I pay to you. Say if I own a bunch of wind turbines and now mm. suddenly I get subsidies, have higher margins. I, I disagree with that in this sense. Mm. I think there's a good chance if you own a bunch of wind turbines, you might be a smart guy. You might have entrepreneurial giftedness. You might have the ability to solve problems. You might mm. have the ability to create a path to profits because you have this human talent that God has blessed you with. And now the money you're getting from the government disincentivizes 
you to go out and create that innovation, that that solution set that you're otherwise wired to go create. Entrepreneurs create profits. Mm -hmm. But when all of a sudden you're in the game of gaming tax credits, your focus is off of actually leveraging wind and solar and and instead moving into how you can best manipulate in the system. Not to mention, and this I think is where you were going, Robert, you, 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 you're going to get people that do projects for the tax credit to yeah. offset another profitable project they have. And so it distorts that in the market. And so I, I am on the track of you are, and I think this comes down to, Julian, some of the things we own in our portfolio. Look, there is a reason some of the biggest oil and gas companies in this country are pushing hard mm -hmm. for a carbon tax. Oh, yeah. They, it will hurt smaller and mid-sized players. And they mm -hmm. have the ability to absorb it. And then, and then when all said and done, you get a higher commodity price. You you have an artificially constricted uh, level of supply, so their margins expand. And then you come out of it with less competitors you have to go toe to toe with. Kind of like the tobacco regulation, right. FDA, FDA regulation on the tobacco companies with Altria during the Obama administration. That, just, was, that was the biggest boon yeah. to those companies, you know, in and, years yeah. and years. And can we just explain? perhaps what might happen to global emissions if you increase the price of, say, natural gas in this country? Because, you know, those markets are global, right? What what are, you know, end users of fossil fuels going to do if, you know, commodity A's price goes up? They're going to switch to something different, something perhaps dirtier like coal around the world. Uh, that's right. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you look at what natural gas production has done for the emissions in the United States. We've, we've been technically decreasing. Our second derivative of use of emissions is, is gone down in this country as large as a result of, of fracking greenhouse, you know, greenhouse well, gas. Well, it's gone down substantially. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. So, I, I mean, if you if the end result is decreased emissions of greenhouse gases, do, do what has, has worked in the past. Re repeat that going forward. I, I just don't understand why they're not pushing that a little bit. But even apart from criticizing the policy and our kind of political and, sure. and trying to do more thoughtful economic extrapolation of this, from the investor standpoint, and, and either Day or Julian or both chime in. He says one of his policy ideas is fascinating to me because we're heavily focused on currency and where it could affect things we're doing as investors. Impose a border adjustment tax on any imports from a country that does not have a carbon tax. So it's a social policy agenda. You have to have a carbon tax in your country because it's going for the right climate uh, agenda we have. Okay, uh, fine. And then, But then what does that do to the U.S. dollar? If, if, uh, if he's putting a border adjustment tax for that reason – how, how does the currency itself not just simply adjust? And could you accidentally get a weaker dollar because of something like a border adjustment tax out of it? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I think uh, – and this is pr the problem with uh, politicians and policy, more broadly speaking, is uh, they're not really invested in the long term. I mean they're incentivized to – uh, to send good messages out there. They're incentivized to get reelected. And – and a lot of this stuff may have some sort of impact in the short term that they can then go market. But in the long term, you know, the dollars are going to adjust, corporations are going to adjust. And uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, the, the the consequences of all this may look very, very different than the intentions. Sure. So, uh, but as far as how the dollar is going to going to react, um, if uh, if the countries that we're trading with, we impose a tariff on it because they don't have a, a carbon tax. Was that the question? Right, that's what he's threatening to do, okay, and then okay. and then again, if you end up with a border, first of all, I think it'd be fascinating to have a border adjustment tax with with uh, you, you know one country and not with a country right next door and so yeah. forth, and then it's, all the manipulation. It sounds very much like the the tariff uh, that Trump is doing, and uh, it can't be good for the economy. It's and that quite, means you're going to literally, except for in this well, case, the, it would be our yeah. currency that mm -hmm. could could adjust for it. And you're going to have retaliation for well, the, the countries. Least, yeah. You know. yeah, at least with with tariffs, one of the goals presumably is to you know protect IP and and you know encourage competitiveness. This is just giving the advantage to your competitor. Totally. You know. So. Totally. Yeah, and and he's a, and uh, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. He's a little less uh, draconian about tariffs. And I, I after all after seeing all this, I'm so surprised that he's running. I mean, this is so left leaning that the, the fact that. He's being considered more a moderate is just amazing to me. Well, let's um, let's be fair to him. That's well, a byproduct of, of it's mm -hmm. relative to the the it's leading the voice. Right. He's dealing with uh, Senator Warren, and and of course Bernie Sanders' level has stayed very constant. He's mm -hmm. been right up in the leader. He's never. No one's really ever thought Bernie Sanders is about to be the nominee, but he's never dropped into fourth, fifth, sixth place. Yeah. It's not like he's you know Kamala Harris or something. Yeah. Um, and to Mayor Pete's um, you know credit at least, with, whenever he's coming out with a lot of these policies, he's at least 
looking to be deliberative about it. He's saying, hey, this is maybe a policy I'm considering instead of, you know, I'll pick on Warren. She comes out with these plans with completely flawed inputs and assumptions to it. Yeah. And I think that's been transparent uh, these days. Um, so, Julian, let's talk investment side of, of taxes. This is very interesting. You pointed out he had uh, past talked about, like, you know, a financial transactions tax. Um, he's open to the idea of a wealth tax, but he hasn't put meat on the bone the way that Sanders and Warren have. However, he's the only candidate I've studied so far who has said, I will go straight for a higher marginal tax rate. And ironically, mm -hmm. yep. you guys know, Elizabeth Warren has not suggested that. Now, she hasn't needed to because she's talking about tripling the payroll tax for people over 250000 And she has her all of her other tax portfolio. But he's actually suggesting a higher marginal rate. And then the other part I, I'm paying attention to for our purposes he has not come out with any suggestions around capital gains or dividends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are dividends um, now thought of as sacrosanct? They can't touch it? Or, or is there a possibility that the, ne the present value of our dividends that we invest in could, in fact, be impeded by additional taxation. Are they, are they kind of linked, uh, as far as discussion goes, to long-term capital gains tax? Mm -hmm. um, well, in um, theory, in th they are right now in current tax code, but that's not inherently true. They never were until the Bush second tax cut. Uh, capital gains always had um, their own different tax rates over the years, and dividends were taxed as ordinary income. Right, but in this current climate of thinking, do people think about them in one and the same as far as— uh... Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to answer. They okay. think about them as one and the same okay. because okay. the last two tax bills that came out treated them one and the same. That was Bush in 2004. They both were taxed the same at mm. a 15% rate. And Obama fiscal cliff resolution in 2013, they both were kept at 15% with a 20% kicker over $450,000 of, of marriage, marriage yeah. income. Yeah. So I guess, Julian, would you think differently about the value of our dividends if the tax on dividends went higher? That's just a generic question. Um, <laughs> well, I guess, uh, yes, you would look at it on, on the net basis. Uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, you know, net to you is going to, you know, instead of being taxed at 15, it becomes 25, 35, I guess, on a net basis. Uh, that's what we... Uh, uh, I guess right. it would. You're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're taking the easy way to answer. <laughs> I'm going to make it hard. Yeah. Would it make the value of those dividend stocks more vulnerable? Um, so I you, never ask a question that I don't already know the so answer if you, to. If you change the tax specifically <laughs> just on dividends. Yeah, if the dividend tax rate went higher, would you Was think dividend, would you think dividend stocks equal? would go lower? I, well, I think that yeah, they they would be impacted. Yes, they should. You know, relatively to the rest, would uh, would go lower. Uh, yeah. yeah, seems so, logical, so right? I, I, seems logical. I, yeah, Brian, I, I would take the, I mean, this. Is what makes a market, I guess. I would take take the other side of that. I mean, I think anytime you do something across the playing field like that on a relative basis, what has really changed? Not much. I mean, you've got a dividend stock that's growing, that income paying back to shareholders. That's still going to happen, albeit it'll be taxed at a higher rate. But that versus a company not doing that, there's still value in that. And so, I don't know that it would inherently send the prices lower. I don't know that it would really change our, our strategy that much. I, I guess I'd have to look at the tax code and what things changed. But uh, the philosophy, I think, would still hold true. And by the way, dividend tax rates have changed a ton over the years. So they're, they're very attractive now. The high, tax rate on dividends, the high tax rate on dividends for uh, several <clears throat> years into our career was 39.6%. Exactly. And President Bush lowered it to 15%. That's virtually a 65% reduction. Did dividend stocks go up when that happened more than the rest of the market. Not really. No, it did not. Okay, so, but that was so also why, growth so why is the value. inverse not true? Sure. So, so let, me, uh, let, me, let me take the, not the other side, but maybe there's the, a third the, side. There's, there's a third, third way. <laughs> you got it, the fourth way <laughs> coming? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a third side. Um, so it, are you saying that if no other, nothing else in the tax code changes besides the <clears throat> dividend uh, tax rate? Long-term capital gains stays the same, short-term cap rate, I'm happy, uh, to I'm happy to pretend that. Okay, happy to pretend that. If everything else were to stay constant, which I don't think would happen, I, it, I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, why there won't be a slight multiple reduction on dividend stocks, just given that there's uh, a, a... Okay, here's what I'm saying. I, I still think that it's going to be very attractive, and the fact that the companies pay dividends, all those th same things still apply. But if there's a higher tax rate, I mean, think about how we're going to make adjustments in our portfolio. Uh, we're going to probably think more about asset location, 
right? If uh, dividend uh, dividend income tax rates are higher, it depends uh, on what those tax rates go to. I, I'm okay, assuming it's okay, like a five percent. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, if sure. they tax them at ninety nine percent or something. Sure, I'm saying like a, du- a doubling yeah. of the tax. Rate. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a lot. Well, even yeah. the corporates would probably do something. Right. I mean, they would I, do more buybacks, maybe and less there, dividends. I assume there would be some sort of uh, repricing. And now, this is with the caveat that nothing else in the tax code changes whatsoever. Um, it, it, I mean, if you think about the uh, what va- what's the valuation of an asset? Do you know, do you know of an what they're asset? all missing, or do I? Am I going to? No, no, I, 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 I'm waiting for I'm waiting yeah. for you to respond. I mean, but if you think about the valuation of an asset as the present value of its discounted future cash flows on an after-tax basis, seems that's, logical. That's going to that's mm-hmm. going to be less. So, so again, uh, I'd go yeah. back to my yeah. other yeah. question: well, is why it didn't happen. inverse in 2004? Um, okay, or so, not even close. Uh, no substantive connection. None. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't know what else was changing in in 2004. Uh, well, the well, dividend the, tax rate dropped substantially. Capital gain tax rate barely went down at all. Capital gains were already at 22%. They came to 15. Dividends went from 39.6 to 15. Um, and and so the, the reality is that even when dividend rates have gone higher, you haven't seen it affect dividend stock pricing in the past. And when dividend stocks have gone lower, you haven't seen it benefit them either. But uh, it, you want a chance to uh, guess where I'm going, or do you want me just go, to? Go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say on a relative basis, where would I want to put my money in a in a less competitive environment? It's going to be the the more stable companies that have been paying dividends going back. That's what I would say. So I, I would presume their prices to I, I don't know if I call it rally, but perhaps rise a little bit as a kind of a internal market. Love well, that what is the tax yeah. Yeah. play on it. Yeah. I would actually agree with you. Yeah. I actually Julian, what is the tax on dividends for someone who owns stock in their IRA? <laughs> Zero. What is the tax on dividends for someone who owns stock in their 401k? It's actually Zero. 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 Profit sharing plan. Mm-hmm. It's a deferred ordinary income. That's what it is. Zero, zero. It's deferred ordinary income. That's incorrect. <laughs> that is wrong answer. The answer is the tax is zero. So you're saying you do not you must, get taxed on the dividend. That's true. Yeah, you yeah. get taxed at withdrawal on the withdrawal. That's right. right. So, are so you what is that the tax most of the money that's invested? What is the tax in endowments? Which is forced. What is the tax in endowments? Zero. Zero. Pension funds. Zero. Sovereign wealth. Zero. Okay. So this is the answer. That the democratization of stock ownership is so unbelievably skewed against taxable accounts mm. that it is um, Do you know the split? Well, it's uh-huh. varies year by year, but it's a seven handle. It's in between seventy I, and eighty percent. Oh, okay. Okay. Is I thought it was close to And close that's to, in U.S. not even global. I thought it was close to 50 401ks, yeah. essentially. Yeah, I thought it was yeah. close to 50 Retirement plans? Yeah. Not, but I'm saying even institutional ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, of course, there are there is uh, very difficult there, – there's such a heavy ownership in, in algorithmic, non-economic owners of stocks, high frequency and so forth, that are big liquidity providers to the market but don't aren't necessarily the holders of companies the way we are. So at the end of the day, the best thesis, because everything Dan and Julian said is exactly right. If if you're going to receive something that's worth five and now after tax is going to be worth four, to to value that on a go forward, you have to assume it's a lower valuation, more less cash in hand. However, that is not proven to be true. So therefore, we don't get the luxury of saying, well, it's supposed to be true, therefore it will be. It hasn't been. So we have to answer why. And the best answer I've seen is that taxability in, in accounts, it's a ma- it affects us. Like from a financial planning standpoint, we're going to tell a client, hey, you're going to have 200 grand, and now we got to tell them you're going to have 190 grand. Mm-hmm. That affects their pro forma. But I, of course, ask the question very specifically to the valuations of stocks. Do we expect a raise higher in dividends would move the needle. And the best thing we could do is say, historically, it hasn't. Mm-hmm. And maybe one of the best reasons the, the, is the tax the, freeness the, of the. As far, it, just, just, I will add, um, just as far this, this is Were kind you surprised of, uh, by where I went with that? No, no, not at all. I, yeah. I was actually operating under the, the assumption that it was about a 50 50 split between taxable and mm-hmm. non taxable type uh, type money that's that's invested in uh, dividend stocks. I didn't have that data. Uh, but this is a, also speaks to a broader conversa- conversation about theory versus practice. And theoretically, it from from a, on a mathematical basis, it does make sense that there would be a repricing, but oftentimes in practice, uh, like David was just mentioning, historically it hasn't proven to be true. So there's always uh, these challenges in capital markets that we have to deal with. I agree. I think one of the other things that that brings to light too, when you were asking about how Buttigieg has, you know, but or maybe Julian mentioned, you know, there's a state tax. Uh, he wants to make it more equitable, whatever that means. Then there's uh, you know top tier tax bracket going higher and those types of things, but dividends. 
and capital gains aren't really touched, well, we kind of define probably why that could be, which is it doesn't really raise tax revenue all that much <laughs> if all of those, as David said, you know, those dividends aren't taxed inside of retirement accounts and pension accounts anyway. <laughs> what's the real point of doing that? doesn't really, you know, it, it hurts prices potentially and it doesn't really bring a whole lot more income, so why do it at all? Yeah, I also uh, would say a really contrarian and kind of unprovable but also unfalsifiable theory of mine. The second you raise taxes on dividends, you can start repricing the fact that one day they're going to cut the taxes on dividends. So you're pricing into the future, <laughs> the future dividend cut right, that's right. coming. Once yeah, that yeah. happens. Every election cycle yeah. gets you know, a rally with the Republican. So, so uh, Julia, know there's a lot of commentary around this. And I must be a little frustrating because I know the American politics theme is not necessarily the thing that you would spend a whole lot of time thinking about or has been a driving factor in, in your research process throughout your career. But when you look at anything that you've studied and we've kind of discussed as an investment committee, Mayor Pete or any of the candidates running, Donald Trump for that matter, is there something in the fiscal agenda of the 2020 election that strikes you as an immediate catalyst to portfolio rethinking? Um, not really. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, the... the the one thing that uh, I'm most interested in is that, you know, if, if there's any chance uh, a Democratic uh, president and if they have, if he, assuming they have majority as well to get that vote, it could repeal the tax cuts that uh, that uh, uh, Trump did and that could have a significant impact. But sure. it's way too early um, to um, to have a view on that. As you said, you know, it's going to be a close election, I guess, or who knows. And and then, as you say, even if that was to happen, we're going to again maybe uh, four years later we would reprice a new a new tax uh, tax yeah. cut. So sometimes two years later, I mean, that's the thing that's so interesting. Like I go back to because I learned a lot from it personally when President Obama was reelected in 2012, and you had this very a historical reality that a bunch of these Bush tax cuts were going to expire, and they called it a fiscal cliff. Go look at what the market did sure. in December of 2012 going into 13 sometime. And then look at what the market did in 2013. It's huge. 30%. 30%. Massive. Yeah. And the reason being that uh, you could think, oh, a Democrat who likes taxes got elected or someone who likes taxes got elected. That doesn't mean that they're going to be able to go forward with that policy proposal because at the end of the day, most of the people, they're smart enough to get elected president. They're not necessarily smart in an intellectual way, but savvy enough, street smart enough to get elected. They also are savvy enough to realize if I do something that's going to completely screw up the economy or the perception of the economy, that's why the dividend tax cut, it's not going back to 39.6. No, I just don't believe it. The risk reward is the, there's not the a lot of tax seniors, revenue. The amount of senior citizens that are getting ta dividends from utilities mm. and all of a sudden we think they're going to triple their tax on it. Yeah. And, and by the way, we've already tripled their tax. How do we do it? We brought interest rates from their CDs oh, right, from 5% sure. mm. to 1%. Yeah. Well, so, they lower, I mean, lower their taxes, but it decreased their income. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, who's pushing granny off a cliff in a wheelchair now, yeah. right? You're, you're, they can't get any money as savers. And then you talk about raising those taxes. I don't believe it. But but um, let me let me do this to kind of close this up a little. If we were being intellectually honest, we wouldn't do another uh, investment committee podcast on Mayor Pete or Elizabeth Warren. And we're not going to do it. But what we ought to do is an uh, investment committee podcast on Cory Gardner's race in Colorado, Susan Collins' race in Maine, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Martha McC McSally's race in Arizona. There's three, four, five Senate seats that are going to dictate the direction of the Senate. That's a good point. And there is no, and we said this on our last podcast. I think all of us, in one way or another, made this point. Read whatever you want from Mayor Pete. Listen to whatever you want, Liz Warren, on a debate stage. And we keep forgetting Joe Biden. He's still out there yeah. somewhere. <laughs> little theory a very close political friend of mine shared is that Joe Biden could end up proving to be the Mitt Romney of this cycle in that no one was really excited about him. He's been in the lead. He's been presumed. But then they're going to go try on every other outfit before just coming back to him. And and you saw that with, with Romney in 12. He, he got the nomination, but that didn't stop. Republicans from looking at Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich, yeah. they, you know what I mean? Yeah. Herman Cain for a little while, 999. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We should do a podcast <laughs> on what, where our economy would be with 999. You guys remember that? Yeah, I yeah. do. <laughs> but but uh, do you know what we're talking about, 999? No. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Yeah, we, we can share it to you offline. It was, it's not a, something that we're real proud of. Is a, well, no, I think that that's the point is, what's the point of interpreting the presidential side when you don't know the way Senate will go? And, and there's three, four, five Senate seats that are really going to make a big difference in what kind of moral authority, political capital, 
intellectual gravitas, and most importantly, legislative math that anyone who wins is going to have going into 2020. I'd even flip-flop that. What if the Dems do take the Senate, but Trump keeps the White House? That's not impossible that that yeah. could happen. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so all of those things are going to create a very different dynamic. And it does help us conclude to the point that we've all been stating. You can't form a vessel policy out of these things. It's one thing if you had to bet on who will win the presidency, which, which is pretty much impossible to do, I think. Right now, we have to talk about who's going to win the nomination and the presidency and three or four Senate seats. And then you still have to bet on how those people that got elected or reelected or what have you would then go vote. Because to my earlier point, I don't believe all of I don't think that you'd have 51 votes to repeal the corporate tax cut. And certainly not in the House. Yeah. Right. I just think it, it, it's a trickier political environment and it sure doesn't hurt to use that opportunity for us to remind our clients and the people that we are fiduciaries for of the fundamentals of the benefit of dividends, no matter what the tax rate is. Dividend stocks went up in the 50s and the rate was 90 percent. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, everyone was cheating on the taxes. Mm -hmm. God bless them. But my point being, <laughs> my point being that 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 at the end of the day, the fundamentals we talk about, they're so much more important than politics. And we're doing whole podcasts on politics, and the media's talking all the time. Why? Well, that's what people want to talk about. It's yeah, interesting. It's, it's fun. But fun. when we when we're when we turn when when Brian turns off the camera and we go back to looking at the new companies report and the new announcement and the new utilities commission and the this and that, it's not politics. It's fundamentals. Fundamentals. That's right. Amen. Dale? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's how, how do the, these things influence fundamentals, and that's a whole different conversation than just just the mood of the moment and talking about what the political atmosphere is like and who's going to win the nomination or who's, who's going to win uh, this or that. So I think, uh, I think it's important to focus on to get an idea of how these companies operate in the, in the system that we are in, uh, but actually trying to make predictions on how these different policies will all play out is uh, is very different. It can get very emotional, and I would encourage people to uh, to really divide their political feelings with uh, the intellectual side of portfolio management. So that's a good good point. Anyone else have any closing comments they want to make? We'll uh, yeah. we'll wish our listeners a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Right. Thanksgiving. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we will come back to you next week. It will be into the month of December uh, next time you hear from us. But in the meantime, do enjoy that uh, Thanksgiving time. Uh, we're thankful not only for all of you, but we're uh, thankful for the opportunity to share this podcast with you. And we're thankful for the five-star review you're about to leave us right now. <laughs> happy, Thanksgiving. happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.